welcome to our WonderCon panel. I'm Brianna Winner, and I'm Brittany Winner, and we are the Winner Twins, and this is Todd McCaffrey and Dave. Hello. Hinton. We are so honored to have you both on this year's WonderCon panel, and our topic today is going to be how to create your own novel from first idea to publishing. So our goal is to tell, tell you all the information we kind of wished we knew when we started. And we really have some amazing experts on here today. We do. So uh, why don't we start with um, Dave, could you introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Dave Chesson. I'm the creator of Kindlepreneur.com, uh, one of the world's largest book marketing websites. I'm also the founder of Publisher Rocket, a book marketing software uh, used between publishing companies as well as self-publishers. Uh, I've been a paid consultant to a lot of publishing companies, especially in fiction. Uh, I myself am also a nonfiction writer. I went from being a full-time in the Navy uh, to be able to make enough money for my books to get out of the military. Now I'm here in Franklin, Tennessee with my wife and kids writing every day. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. And uh, Todd, could you introduce yourself? I am Todd McCaffrey. Uh, I've been writing since 1984. Uh, I'm a New York Times bestselling author known for his work with the Dragon Writers of Pern, as well as several independent books and some books in collaboration with the amazing Winter Twins. Yay, jazz hands. <laughs> jazz hands. Ooh, weird jazz hands. Space <laughs> jazz hands. Space jazz hands. Live long and get the camera to find out where your fingers are. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Well, it just looks more like alien fingers, which matches more your, your whole look going on there, Todd. There you go. And uh, I, once again, I'm Brianna, and I, we're, we may write science fiction, but sometimes when it comes to the actual science, specifically technology, I'm a little bit inept. So it says Brianna, but we're not both named Brianna. I'm Brianna, and I will always be on this side. And I'm Brittany, and I'll always be on this side. But everyone calls her Brit. <laughs> so uh, we are authors. We actually started writing professionally when we were 12 years old, and then we went national into every uh, Barnes and Noble and Borders, RIP Borders store on our 13th birthday. We were independent before it was cool and so, before the ebook. So we've been working for, we just turned 26. So uh, our first book went national when we were 13, but was published by the time we were 12. So how many years that is, is terrifying and we don't need to go into it. That's fine. It's cool. <laughs> so, <laughs> we've, we've been doing this and working conventions since then too. We've worked over what, almost 200 conventions now. I've lost track. And uh, we also do, uh, we're, we're both dyslexic and uh, Brit is legally blind. Yeah, so we started writing to overcome dyslexia. Uh, and then about four years ago, uh, I went blind and it changed the way that I write forever. And hopefully that I can give some input for, for those of you that don't write, you know, that can't just sit down and type on a keyboard that need to write differently. So uh, the, the whole reason we do these panels and we teach writing is to be able to do what we you know, we'll get the information that we wish we had uh, when we started writing, make it easier for you guys to be able to write and publish and get your dreams out there. We were a, real, a really big believer in what, you know, what, what, is it, what, what is it, like, um, you know, helping others is helping yourself. And I think that over the years, that's really come, it's really been proven to be true, really. So let's get this going um, and talk about how you got started. Uh, I think it's really great to start our panels this way because uh, for me at least, I love to learn how other people got started because it, it, it inspires me and, and, and gets to learn about different avenues of, and different ways to go. So why don't we start with, start with Dave? Sure. Well, I, I'm like you guys. I actually was dyslexic. Uh, well, still am. It's not like you ever hear it, really. Um, but I grew up my entire life believing that I'd never be a writer. Uh, that's because I struggled the most in, in class. Um, my English was always the worst. Uh, or according to my professors, teachers. Um, I still remember some of the fun comments that I got as a kid. So I never really grew up thinking that writing was going to be my thing. I went into math and engineering just because, you know, that seemed to be something that I could do. But it doesn't mean your passion for writing goes away. And so later on in life, I started getting to this point where, you know, my wife asked me the question. She's like, what do you really want to do, uh, you know, in the military? Are you trying to be an admiral? Is there some life goal that you want? What is it? And so when we sat down and really started talking about it, I realized 
I didn't want to be in the military. I didn't want to do a full 20 plus years. You know, uh, I want to be home with my kids. I want to be with my family. And if I got out of the military, I'd just jump into another nine to five job, having me travel all over. So that's when we started to really look at what, what one could do. And that's really when the passion kind of took over about maybe I could really make it with writing that I could start creating my own uh, books. And even more so for me is I was on the other side of the world. So what's amazing about selling your books is that your books sell while you sleep and while you're awake. Uh, it does not require you to have to be there to do customer support or shipping or to place an order or any of that. It's once you've created it and you've started doing your marketing, uh, your book is selling whether you're out to sea, at home, or on vacation. And so that really appealed to me. And I started to really dig in to try to figure out how can someone who's not a great writer get there? And it's not about selling a bad book, but what it is, is it taught me that you have to really practice. I mean, every day you write, you will get better. It's just kind of a natural thing. Um, and so I started doing that. Another thing that was really important for me was trying to understand the market. Uh, I wanted to have a better chance that my writing would reach an existing market than try to invent a market. So I really did a lot of time of, of using that kind of analytical brain to look into Amazon and to look into Barnes and Noble and really ask myself, what's selling? What do people want? What makes a good book? Why is this book selling more than this book? And when I started to get into that, that was a very natural fit for me. And that really helped me to uh, kind of create the books that really fit a market and helped me with sales. And so when I combined the continuous practice with also the understanding of the market, that's when I really started to shine. And that's when I started to be able to get myself out of the military and be here in, in Nashville. That's awesome. Yeah. You've done so much for authors. It's really incredible. Yeah. Well, thank it, you. That's... Yeah. I've been a fan for a while. <laughs> so, uh, and, uh, Todd, it's your turn. And yeah. I think you're probably going to start with space cat. We know Todd too. Well, we do space cat. No, I'm going to start with the wonderful flight to the mushroom planet just to uh, mess with your head. Oh, uh, well, that is, uh, also a, a classic. And I, I like the cover. I recently just saw the book. He ordered one. Anyways, you, you go on. We'll stop. Okay. Talking. <laughs> uh, so, no, um, I started reading science fiction when I was very little. Um, Scholastic was probably the biggest uh, initiator with all the books they gave and their little, you know, they'd come into the schools and you could go tick off marks and get books. And I was willing to spend thousands and thousands of other people's dollars. Uh, but um, Space Cat was one of the ones I picked up. Uh, and, you know, I sort of graduated from there over to Heinlein and his juveniles, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and then went on. Um, so I'd been reading for a very long time and, and still continue to read a whole bunch. Uh, and that's kind of the, the first requirement. I wouldn't say quite requirement. It's certainly one of the first indicators that you're going to be a writer is you, you're reading books and now there's the, the books you want to read aren't there. You're going to have to write them yourself. Yeah. Mm. I like that. So is, are you, are, are you, are you going to continue? Is, was there more to say? Yeah, space I don't cats. Know. Space cats. <laughs> well, space yeah, yeah. Okay. You want me to go on? <laughs> so, so yeah, there's, there's, they know the story too well. So with space cat, um, the cover of space cat was a cat in a uh, a goldfish bowl space suit with silver space suit and a three finned uh, Chelsea bone stealth rocket ship, the standard rocket ship uh, on the moon and, and some poor overworked astronaut waiting in the background. And, and that was the book I was reading. And my mom, Ann McCaffrey, the late great Grandmaster Nebula Award winner uh, at that time had just published one of her first shorts called The Ship Who Sang. Uh, and it was in the magazine of fantasy and science fiction. And the cover of that was a banana floating against a star field, very much like the star field behind me. Um, and uh, my mom, you know, kind of proudly wanted me to read her story. And it was kind of like, well, let's see, you got a banana floating in space. I got a cat on the moon. I'm going with the cat on the moon. So. Wow. I love that. And they, they've heard this, the twins have heard this story a few times before. Uh, but that's what started it. And of course, later on, I started reading mom's stuff too, and, and really loved it. 
And uh, much, much later on, we thought that it'd be cool to collaborate together, and we did. So, and that, that brought us five books in collaboration, and I wrote three books solo in the Pern universe, which was a great place to be. Uh, and after that, went off and wrote several solo books, and then I met these guys. And apparently, we both had the same thought at about the same time, which was, huh, wouldn't it be nice to collaborate together? And so we've done so. Uh, For we got, four years. Yep, oh, indeed. Yeah. yeah, I know, age, time, it Fair passes. Time. I, I anyway. So we got started. Um, well, it's, it's interesting. We've been obsessed with science fiction and fantasy. We started with sci-fi since we were kids. We should probably start out, why don't we say the, the whole story? So. Britt and I, we were born 11 weeks early and we were very sick for the first six to seven years of our lives. Bubble kids, kind of bubble kids, yeah. But uh, we didn't have a chance. We were converted young to everything nerdy and geeky and uh, fun because our, our parents are were Trekkies and- Third generation. Yeah, we're, our, we come from a very nerdy family. So we grew up with comic books and, and Star Trek and Star Wars and you know everything wonderful. You know, a little, we, were, we were what we were painting, the little Warhammer action figures. And we, it, we didn't have, because we were kind of, we were very isolated when we, in our formative years, we only could play with each other. So we played a lot of pretend. And our pretend games were all sci-fi and fantasy. And we, from the beginning, just had a passion for storytelling. And as we got older, we, our health improved, but it became clear that we had dyslexia. Yeah, dyslexia, and I didn't know it. I was visually impaired. So my dad decided to try to teach us, how, specifically me, how to read through comic books, and it worked. So it would be a big treat. If we got all our homework done by the end of the week, on Friday night, we would go to the comic book store and get a big stack of golden age comics golden age that's and we still have all of them and those were the appropriate ones we learned now they're all the very clean ones but we just thought oh well this is the best thing we've ever seen in our lives so it was just two little twins surrounded by comic books and little action figures and and we couldn't be we couldn't have been happier we still can't be happy yeah we're, we're, it was the right place to be mm -hmm. so our dyslexia you know kept getting worse and i couldn't even read when we wrote our uh our first book combined my dyslexia combined with visual impairment I couldn't see the board and I couldn't read um, any books. By the time I, I'll give you an, in school, by the time the, the lesson was over, I, I couldn't find my page in the books that were large print. So it just didn't, didn't work. We were mm. so unhappy. And our dad decided to convince us to write a book. And because he saw how passionate we were about storytelling and our confidence was low and we were getting bullied a lot. But this is where it gets kind of interesting. Um, that could apply to today as well. Uh, we took our book, we, we edited it with the help. We, got, we have wonderful parents that help us get an editor. Uh, and we actually sent it in for independent awards. Now, we were young and just decided to go for it and submitted for like a bunch. And we won eight, which was, which uh, was crazy. With wonderful, good confidence boost, I got to say. Yeah, and this is, this is back in like 2000. We don't have to go there. Eight. Oh, oh yeah, time I know, That wasn't that long for most people. Oh, just shh. So let me have my pity party. Oh. And, and that's actually how we got discovered and picked up by Barnes and Noble and, and Borders. And we started doing the convention circuit. Uh, uh, so that's, those awards are still out there as, as well as writers of the future, which we didn't even know about. That's what, if I was going to tell, we're probably going to repeat this later. Yeah. But uh, writers of the future, if I were talking to any new writers that haven't had anything previously published, I'd say writers of the future, writers of the future, writers of the future. That's what you should to admit for, but we could talk about that more later. Let's go to our next question. Well, I think we are going to catch up on what happened in the years after that. We ended up working comic cons and right. going behind the booth. And uh, we just, and then we ended up opening a nonprofit called Motivate to Learn. And we started to teach writing. Yeah. And now we're on staff at UCLA and we teach with UCLA Extension. And we've also written nonfiction. We've expanded to writing fantasy and and science fiction and comic books and we've written with Todd and released over 20 books and it's been really cool being able to live my life and write with my bestest friend and which is one of the reasons why we're such a big fan of Dave because he's doing uh and he's promoting what our, our dreams are and we just think he's just incredible I'm gonna say then it's very exciting we also we also like with you we also like you Todd you're all right thank you 
Okay, we've now only, we'll go to our next question. We've only written like what twenty books with Todd. I don't even remember anymore. He's yeah. a lot, a lot Todd's of books. okay. He's all right. Well, he's he's family now. We're, we're family. So, well, this this next question I wanted to specifically ask about uh, writing and working during the last almost a year during COVID and with isolation. Now, the tons comes out will be a year. Yeah, you're right. It'll be a year. And I wanted specific wanted to specifically ask Dave about what it's like to write and how you've been able to work consistently while having little ones around too. Yeah, I think one of the biggest things is guarding your time. Um, you know, one of the things that's really helped me, and I'm not going to say that this works for everybody else is I'm a morning person. Uh, so I get up at four in the morning. And the reason why I do that is because there's nobody to bother me. Uh, you know, <laughs> the kids are still sleeping. The wife is still sleeping. There's no honeydew lists right? There's nobody on social media. Nobody's going to answer my email. You know, there's nothing that's going to pop up. That really is that golden time. Plus on top of that too, I found that I'm a much better writer when I've had coffee and I'm a <laughs> one coffee a day person. So I get the best done in the beginning. Um, and when you do that life, whether it's COVID or whether it's, you know, a recital or anything that pops up, it doesn't affect you because nothing's happening at four in the morning. So I would highly recommend that uh, for those who really want to get committed and who want to have the habit of writing, which is incredibly important for growth as well as learning and improving your writing over time, I would say really section off that time. Where most people fall off is when they try to fit it in their life and then they have to spend what I call calories figuring out when it's going to work. And it's so easy to say, no, nope, not today. Uh, you know, maybe I'm tired. Maybe work was too much. Maybe the kids are asking for me. My wife needs me to go do this. And all of a sudden, our writing just kind of disappears. So for me, writing at 4 a.m. was a huge game changer to creating a everyday habit of undisturbed writing, no matter what, no matter what's happening in the world, no matter what's happening uh, with my family. And uh, it's something I still hold on to today. Sounds brilliant. I can learn a lot from Matt and maybe I should do that. We're sorry about the dog. Yeah, this is another COVID problem. The fact that we're, so this guy, this is Ziggy Stardust, the Chihuahua. Um, speaking of guarding your time and, you know, having <laughs> to learn, this guy is, is, we thought he was the quiet one. Yeah, we no. were wrong, so we apologize to him We apologize. That. So I guess he's um, joining us for the, for the time being. He could be quiet. He better be quiet. Otherwise he's going to be a kebab. <laughs> So one cup of coffee. How do you survive on only one cup of coffee? That, now that's a good question. Should I find somewhere to put this guy? I think he's yeah. okay. Actually, um, so one of the things, I've, and again, I'm kind of a coffee person now because it's such a part of my routine. Um, I actually make it that I don't drink coffee on Saturday and Sunday. Uh, so it's only Monday through Friday. And the reason for that is that by not drinking coffee on Saturday and Sunday, it sort of reduces my, I don't know, tolerance for caffeine. So that when Monday comes around, I'm like, woo, you know, that one cup of coffee is hitting me and I'm rolling. It's the people who are, have, who habitually drink the one coffee every day. It then becomes two to get the same high and then three and four. Uh, you know, some people say coffee's like a drug. Eh, it kind of sounds like that's true. Um, but just to rebalance by not doing that is big. I, my wife and I joke that I call coffee is for writers. I don't know if you ever saw the, the, the movie where the guy is ABC always be closing, but then he also says coffee is for closers. <laughs> um, well, anyway, so it's, it's kind of playing off that movie. And so it's like, I only drink coffee when I write. So it's like reverse Pavlov's dog, where it's like, if I'm drinking <laughs> coffee, I'm like, I need to be writing. Um, and so I reward myself in that respect. So Monday through Friday, 4 a.m., there I am with my cup of coffee and that's it. That's cool. That's, That's an interesting really cool. idea. Yeah, I've done the, the opposite where I drink way too much coffee, but uh, we'll get, Todd will answer. Now we're going to we gotta throw this over to Todd because he's actually been doing something a little bit similar to, uh, just because we know Todd so well, where he's been waking up early. All right, Todd, go for it. So that's a surprise to me. Um, I actually started <laughs> drinking coffee when I was six. What? Uh, okay. I didn't know that. How could we not know that? You never asked. Oh, wow. Well, actually, this so, is, uh, uh, and, and how have you been dealing with writing during COVID? It's terrible. I'm having a hard time because I used to, my, my, my uh, habit became getting up and going to Starbucks in the morning and sitting down, having a nice cup of coffee, 
putting in some earbuds and typing away, but also being able to watch people. You know, every now and then you're, you're at a scene and you're sort of like, hmm, what's next? And you go look up, you see the mom playing with a kid or something. And it's enough interaction with society that it makes it really uh, easy to get back into that story and you know, go, oh, right, that's what people are like. Um, so I'm missing that a lot. And I will be very glad when we get over all this. Um, you know, that the, the um, it, that's, that's probably been my COVID deal. It's really you know, slowed down my output. Um, but I, you know, I've been writing for 35 years. Oh, no, come to think of it, closer to 37 years now. Oh, my God, a long time. Um, I, and that's actually, I've been published for that long time. Uh, so at some point, there's a certain amount of, you just do it. Uh, you admit that there are characters in your head bouncing around. And if you don't get them out, you're going to get, take damage from them. Uh, and, and that's kind of what's going on. Yesterday, I was, I was quite happily surprised that I managed to get words written in two different novels. So that was kind of good. Um, and, and, you know, it, it's coming up, but I, I'm certainly one of the people who's been, so, you know, suffering from the COVID whatever. I want to, I want another C word that goes there that describes this properly. Um, but I, but I haven't found one, but you know, we're still, we're still moving on. I have also, of course, been spending a lot of time with KDP Rocket, looking at increasing the marketing side of things, uh, because I think that's really important. One of, one of the things I'm grappling with is you can write a great book, but unless people can find it, you know, it, it doesn't mean anything. So that's one of the, the big areas I've been looking at in this past 12 months. And, uh, I think Boreal and I have been both handling this differently. So why don't you answer first? I'll, I'll actually, it's something that Todd helped me, with, helped me with a lot. It became very difficult for me to write this last year. And it turns out that for me, you know, for the first few books that we wrote, it was over text to speech. Sorry, speech to text. <laughs> I dyslexified that. Uh, and then I just transferred over purely to typing. And now I'm transferring back to speech to text because I find it easier. I, I realize sometimes it's just going through uh, ebbs and flows. Yeah. yeah. Uh, for me, I'm, this is my first year of being, well, actually I'm in my second year, but it was my first year of being married and moving into a new home and animals. So uh, I've learned that I actually write better in the later afternoons, but I think that I'm going to switch over to what Dave was talking about and trying to get up earlier because I think that might be the most productive way of doing it. Mm -hmm. um, either because I've heard a lot of writers like write late in the evenings. The as night well. writers. The night writers. Brandon used to be a night writer. I used to be. And then I discovered that if I write too late, I think I'm doing a great job and I'm half asleep, but I'm pushing through. Next day I read my work and it's bad. It's bad because I was half asleep. Well, now Kevin Anderson has been, been using uh, speech to text for a very long while. Uh, he has this really cool trick where he gets a, a digital voice recorder and goes off for a hike. And on the first way out, he dictates a chapter. And on the way back in, he just dictates another chapter. Uh, yeah. and, and he points out something that, that is slowly percolating in my, my poor little brain, which is just like learning to type, this is a learned skill. And you have to, you have to stick with it and work at it. Mm -hmm. um, I have tried it before and have had some success with it, but maybe I'll, uh, I'll, I'll think about doing it again. On the other hand, for me, uh, I've been typing since I was 12, which is a hideously long time now. Uh, and so my, my brain to creativity flow is generally, you know, through my fingers onto the keyboard. Yeah, it's, uh, there is something special about typing. Sometimes when I'm doing speech to text, I'll do a mix of both, depending on how I feel. I know, Britt, have you, um, so I don't know if I talked about going blind yet, but uh, I went blind about four years ago, so I see about 20%. So my writing style changed to talk about this. I talked about this earlier, just to reiterate. Um, but I do all speech to text, and then I have a text-to-speech program on my computer that actually reads everything back to me. Uh, so, and then I actually, so it, it's all in my head. And the way that I get it out is all through other programs. Isn't that program the one that'll read back to you? Isn't that free for everybody? I think it might be. No. So this is, I use um, Dragonspeak, uh, Jaws, um, Jaw Fusion, and uh, there is one other one. 
there's, I swear there Todd was. Todd McCaffrey reading out loud to you. Yeah, that's, that's one of the things that's, 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 that's one of the things that's been really cool about our writing is that with Britt being blind, we have to read it to her. And it's amazing what you catch that doesn't work mm -hmm. and just simple typos you just didn't see when you were writing it. Um, so everything that we've written has been read to Brit and, and improved thereby. Um, yeah, it's, it's been a really interesting process uh, with writing and going blind. I actually think it made me a better writer because now that it's all in my head, I have to figure out how to get that on paper. But everything, the way that I view the world, the world is the same way that I used to imagine things. So actually this kind of slides right into our next question. I'm going to have Brit start out with, which, ha which has to do with, you know, I was going to ask about each, uh, each individual's writing style and how they plan out their books when it comes to their, you know, specifically talking about kind of their first draft, uh, right. kind of the pre-editing process. So Britt, I'd love to know more. Okay. I love you to, I, I mean, when I say I know more, I know, I mean, I know you like, I know the back of my hand, but I'd love to, I'd love for you to communicate more about how you kind of come up with your ideas and how you get those ideas on paper. So I'm an extreme planner. Uh, so everything that I write, I, I pretty much know. I've talked about this. Uh, I've either talked about it if I'm, I'm collaborating or if I'm on my own. It's all written out completely. So when I go down to speak out my scenes, I've already figured them out completely and written them down other places. Uh, and it's actually interesting. I can't really read my own notes because I can't see them. But there's something about writing on a notepad that solidifies that in my brain. Uh, and my spelling is probably terrible and it might not even be readable, but it doesn't matter. It, as long as I get it in my head, then I can get it on, on paper. So, uh, that's how I do it. It's all extremely planned out. And also, you know, as you become the transfer to doing the job that you had before to becoming a full-time author, you know, with the help of the, the programs with, with Babe or however you do it, uh, you probably are going to end up writing more than one book at once because they're not just books anymore, they're products. And so you have to think about how much you sell, the right audiences that you're selling to um, in order to you know, pay your bills, do everything else. So right to keep that creative and business balance is, is very important. Uh, and so now the older I get, um, I start to think about what audience I want to write to before I even figure out which book idea I want to write next. Hmm. Um, and why don't we have uh, a, do you have, do you want to answer and then have, I, I, I mean, I'm, I was kind of being the moderator in this particular circumstance. So sure. I'll have everybody else answer. I'll be the last to pop sure. in. It's okay. So what about you, Dave? Well, uh, I like to, so I do a lot in nonfiction specifically, but yep. one of the things that I really love is nonfiction that actually reads like fiction. Um, I think that that's the best way to teach is through story. Mm. So when I want to teach something, I actually will plan out each chapter and I will research like crazy to find some true story or some piece of history that really plays into the, to the lesson that's going to be learned. Um, and sometimes when I'm doing this search for history, I'll find something I'm like, whoa, that's a perfect idea, not for this book. And so I'll save it. Um, one of the lessons I was doing was taught was actually about learning, uh, like a learning process. And I found this uh, story about a Jesuit priest who was brought into the Middle Earth, you know, the Middle Kingdom of China. And he was the first ever to actually learn the Chinese language. And so, but he did this trick where he would see an image and he would just, he had this way of processing it and compartmentalizing it. He had like, he called it his like, uh, it was like an apartment in his head and each room had that image. And so the uh, emperor's court would have this guy in and he would, they would show him like, 400 images and he would just be able to go boom 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 right down down the row and it was because how he compartmentalized the information um and so it just kind of goes on in his history and how he really changed and opened up the court and like i said he was the first foreigner in the court um now what's crazy is is that you could read that chapter right and maybe maybe you'll remember that thing that thing i'm teaching but you'll most definitely remember the story itself. And so I believe that when you start to incorporate these, these components into it, it creates a lasting story. And if you're really trying to teach somebody that can really leave an impression upon them. So I like to start my chapters with some core component. I, I call it the John C. Maxwell tactic because mm. when he wrote the irrefutable laws of leadership, he didn't invent new laws. None of that leadership is brand new. He just found a really good story to help me remember it. 
you know? <laughs> so I like to really uh, use that. And again, there's some amazing stuff in history that like sometimes you're reading history and you're like, yeah, right. Somebody made that up. Come on. And yet, no, it's real. So you can find a lot of inspiration in looking at the things that have happened in the past. And sometimes that really leaves the most lasting impression. I like that a lot. And I agree. Uh, history is always, what is it? History is stranger than fiction. I think the phrase yeah. is. Uh, but I love that. Yeah, yeah. The idea that you can actually, I'm, I'm actually taking, I'm learning. I'm learning. I'm absorbing everything you're saying. Uh, it's, 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 I know with us and particularly Todd, and this is one of the reasons I loved working with Todd and learning from Todd is the emphasis on learning from history has been, uh, I always knew it was important, but I, I didn't realize just how important and how transformative it is to not only, you know, my writing, our writing, but just in viewing the world, you have to understand where we were, to understand where we are and maybe where we can go. Yeah. Now, Todd, I, Todd. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I is. Um, I started out as a pantser. That is, I'd come up with an idea and say, let's go run with it. Um, for some ideas, I have to plot. Uh, and I've learned a lot of plotting along the way. But um, I started off with a story idea. And for people who are new to writing, I suggest you try this. Um, my story idea was, well, they say the meek will inherit the earth. Let's write a story about that. And so I went from there to a, uh, a squire who had been with a knight until the knight got himself uh, flash fried uh, by uh, a, a irate dragon. And the dragon, dragon obviously, <laughs> pardon? I like uh, okay, nothing, peanut gallery. Uh, <laughs> the, drag the dragon obviously had anger management issues. And so my hero had to survive by being meek all the time. Uh, while he was trying to invent his waterproof, fireproof, flameproof armor, which didn't work. Uh, but it was a fun story. It was a throwaway idea. Uh, and so I had nothing invested in it. If it didn't work, it didn't work. Um, I wasn't going to, you know, it wasn't my, my, my life's blood pouring out on the paper. It was like, let's try this idea. So I found that it's a, a lot of fun to go off with these, you know, wild ideas, see where they go. Sometimes they don't work. Um, the more you read, the more you write, the more you learn the craft of writing. Usually you can start with anything and get a story out of it. Um, and, and that's something that takes a while to learn it. Writing is like exercise, like learning to talk, like anything else. The more you do it, the better you get at it. Uh, and I think people, you know, it's very easy to spend hours saying, well, I haven't found the proper, proper word for this. Uh, in which case I will run you into McCaffrey's first law, which is allow yourself to be bad. Uh, it's a lot easier to get something finished and edit it than it is to sit there, you know, wailing about not finding the exact right word for that sentence in your opening paragraph. Because um, you're, you're basically killing yourself. You're, you're, you're ruining your story. Tell the story, go back, fix it. Stephen King said, you know, write the first draft for yourself and then write the second draft for everybody else. Yeah. Um, and while we're on it, if you're a new writer and you haven't heard of the writers of the future, I suggest you check it out. Uh, it's a great place to, to submit to. Uh, it's a great place to learn. They have a lot of supporting people online. Some New York Times bestselling authors are the alumni of the writers of the future. Uh, and it's just awesome. And even if you don't ever submit to Writers of the Future, if you stick with the, the deadline of having a short story ready to submit once a quarter, that means every year you're going to have four short stories that can go out and, and do stuff. And certainly by the end of three or four years, you're really going to kind of know whether this is something you want to do or not. Um, I go back and forth on whether you should write that great American novel that's been sitting in your head first, or whether you should learn a bit more about the craft of writing. I would argue that, uh, you know, you're going to do what you want, but you're going to probably find yourself writing a lot of short stories to actually get the, the feel for what's happening and to understand the world building. Uh, and so 
you know, if you're writing all those short stories, why not submit them to Writers of the Future and maybe win lots of money and certainly win lots of acclaim and all that other cool stuff. So that's kind of where I would say to go. It was interesting is that Todd convinced our, our dad's a very talented artist and uh, we Todd after years convinced him to actually submit and uh, he's one of the winners of illustrators of the future and it's a completely it's a, it's a complete the, fluke so yeah we because we yes. know the people there obviously because that's what we're talking I mean we know and we've worked with them um we got a call and like this is the first time that we have actually known someone that won so it you actually can win, which is which is cool. But and it was having a structure to be able to write to, I think, is important. And if you can't do it yourself, having something like that could be very helpful. Um, we have a couple of students that do that. Um, but let's let's go to our our next question. I actually oh. never got the answer. Oh, sorry. It's all good. Yeah, I guess we'll let Brianna answer. All right. So my process is kind of for me, the way stories come to me are in these very it's almost like a movie in my head so it's it's a uh, very detailed scenes that play out and i have those scenes in my head and i will go and often use that as an ending to a story we actually have a writing book that we wrote together and uh, called we the right path. We wrote two right path books, one together, and then uh, one actually with Todd. And this is kind of in both books where we'll kind of do a one minute sort of meditation or visualization where you sit there and visualize a scene in as much detail as possible and then reverse engineer a story from it. And that's kind of, I think to me, and then we'll you go from there at more, uh, as much planning as you want, for me, I'll, I have these scenes that come to be not necessarily in order with incredible amounts of detail and I realize I have to write it out. Even in dreams, Brianna will come to me or she'll call me in the middle of the night and be like, hey, I just have a story idea. So uh, I, I realize I have, all this, for me, I'm, I have ADD, I'm kind of all over the place. And for me, it's having to channel that without stifling it. So I like kind of loose structure when it comes to planning but i think the most important thing for me is a schedule and a structure so yes. i can write every day or as much schedule as i can coffee schedule coffee or five cups but well for me I, I can't with five cups with me and my add i'll be like i'll i'll leap right over the house and run around screaming but uh, like a maybe a shot of espresso and then a cup of coffee <laughs> for you and then I'll, I'll i'll get i'll get going i i think it's time because we're now i think a little over 30 minutes into our panel, I want to dedicate the rest of it to publishing. Yeah, and that's why I'm, I've been itchy to talk about this because I'm so excited. I, what I'd love to start out with, though, because I think, uh, and uh, Dave, you probably know more about this. I, everyone that kind of comes up to me, particularly if they're, you know, aspiring writers, maybe they wrote their first book, they want to write their first book. But everyone just kind of assumes, or maybe that's changing, but a lot of people assume now the only way to go is traditional publishing. And I really want to talk about the pros and cons of traditional publishing and the pros and cons of independent publishing, and then go into more of a spotlight on independent and hybrid publishing. I think that's, there's so many different things you can do with independent. I'm totally biased, but uh, I'd love to talk about that. And I think there's, uh, we just couldn't have a better panel for this. So Yay. yeah, we're, we're very, we're, we're geeking out about this. Well, I think I think Dave has actually got stuff you guys may not have heard about. No, we, we learned from Dave. Yes, that's well, what and, and so like, I think we want to give him a chance to talk about. Oh you know, no, he's just put up this big, huge set of interconnected writing workshop videos, and and it's like whoa. Yeah, uh, so I mean, we we we, we watch we, and and learn from Dave before we even you know got connected. We've been we've been fans of this before, so take it away, Dave. We'll just sit here and sure. learn. Well, actually, we should probably do some more moderating than just say take it away. Yeah, we're do, do you want to do you want to let Dave have a chance to speak? He's looking kind of us. No, we're, here. we're very quiet. We're we're very quiet twins. If you haven't noticed, we we hate talking. We're very shy, right? I know. Yeah. So the pros and cons of independent uh, versus the pros and cons of uh, traditional, traditional publishing. Right. So I'd like to start with with Dave if you could start on that. Sure. Well, 
here's here's kind of I'm gonna get I'm gonna start by answering this question by giving kind of what I'm seeing on the inside. So I'm brought in on a bunch of uh, publishing companies, especially a bunch here in Nashville. Um, some of the sub affiliates to some of their bigger ones. Um, I've seen small to large, and there's actually and I can't say this for every publishing, but I'm seeing this a lot. Publishing companies are starting to look at self-published authors as almost like free agency, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to use a little bit of sports term. I'm a big fan here. Um, when you are a publishing company, what you want to do is you want to either, you know, sure, if it's an amazing book, you want to publish it, great. But what you really want is that author that you really think is going to sell well, okay? Um, let's imagine author A wrote an amazing book has no background, no following, no email list, no social media presence. Author B wrote a good book, but they have 10,000 email subscribers. They have a social media following. They have books that, you know, they published before on Amazon that have, you know, 500 five stars. Who's going to win? Like in the world now, author B is not only the one that the publishing company gives the contract to or offers a contract, but it's also a more beneficial contract. It's one that actually has money up front. Um, it's also when they do that too, that is the publishing company saying, we're putting money into the game. We're gonna really work hard to make sure that we get our money back at least. Um, and so they're starting to look at self-published authors and they're starting to use them as kind of like, you know, when you're looking at free agency in sports, like say a football team, you're looking at who's available, what's their stats, you know, what's this going to cost? And they're starting to see it that way. Now, 10 years ago, uh, self-published authors used to be like, you know, publishing companies would thumb their nose at the self-published oh, authors. You'd be like, yeah, oh, I, you couldn't make it, you know? And now they're like, huh, you know, this guy already has 10,000 email subscribers. That, that's some pretty good indication of success. Um, so I, I wanted to paint that picture first. And I see that shifting more and more every year. Publishing companies realize they don't have to take a chance on a new person when there's an established author over here. Uh, another thing that's really important too is, is that if you are a first time author and you do get a publishing deal, there's a good chance it might not be a good situation for you. Yeah. Uh, typically, publishing companies will have a certain number of books in a quarter, okay, that they're going to publish. Let's just magically say it's 25. This could be a completely crazy number depending on big or small, but say it's 25 books that they can publish in a quarter. Here's the thing. They'll use their team to help you with selecting the editor, you know, and again, it depends on the phase or the contract you sign, uh, the cover artist, like they'll, they'll do those things and they'll distribute the book when it comes out. However, though, their marketing efforts are very limited. They cannot put a lot of marketing behind all 25 books. Typically what I've seen is, is that there's maybe two or three in that quarter that's going to get their full attention. And the other 22 are going to be one of those of great. We help publish you. And Oh, by the way, here's the 50 things you need to do as the author in order to sell the book. And by the way, here's the quota that we expect you to hit by the next quarter. And if you don't hit that, you might not get responses when you email us again, you know? Um, yep. Whoa. And, and so it's, it's kind of, that's why if you look on the internet, you look on the forums, there's a lot of authors that have a lot of angry things to say about publishing companies because their book didn't sell well, and then they can't seem to get the company to do something with it. Um, but that being said, the ones that really, that have, that make it the three I talked about right out of the 25, those have a great experience because they have the full marketing power, you know, and focus from the publishing company. They can really distribute it. Um, you know, and authors see more from what they, you know, they see more of a result than they would have on their own. So how do you become those three out of 25? Well, it's about being the for sure deal, the, the book that they know will do well. Like, for example, this author has been published before and it succeeded. The company's going to be more likely to put more money and time behind that book and that author because it succeeded before. Or the author has a following and this is a proven deal. You know, they did great with this other company and they sniped them from another one. Um, they're obviously going to get more attention. So all of that to say is um, first things first is that those self-published authors 
that are growing and seeing success over time are now becoming more valued in the eyes of publishing companies. Mm. The second thing to take from this as well is that even if you do get a publishing deal, you're going to have to market you're going to still have to learn how to do that. You don't just get to write, send it in, sit back and have the cash come in. Even if they are going to put their time and effort into you, you're still going to have to roll up your sleeves and do a lot of book marketing yourself. Um, maybe if you're Stephen King, you might not have to, you know, at all. But um, I mean, we're talking about the lottery winners, the, the 0.1% out there that just get to sit back and just benefit from it. Um, so now that we've kind of broken down that story, I guess to say the pros and cons to, say, to finally answer the question, the pros and cons are uh, when it comes to getting a publishing deal, one pro is that sometimes you get that marketing effort behind your book that you can't do yourself. Uh, and that can be big. That can help you to get into stores and bookstores that you normally couldn't on your own. Sure. Uh, you also get access to um, their book cover designers and their editors and their team to make sure that it meets their requirements. Uh, that can be great because sometimes authors might not be very good at selecting the right book cover, whereas the publishing company has a formula and they know because they have years of, of, of data and understanding to know that, no, 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 we need to put a spaceship in the middle of this cover. But there's no spaceship in my story. It's okay. We know this will work. The spaceship needs to be there. So they can help you with those kind of decisions as well. Uh, the cons, though, is most of the time your percentage is very low. Uh, you know, you're not making that much money from the publishing company. You're going to have to sell a lot of units to really make bank from them. Uh, the other con to working with a publishing company is that they really hold control of your book. So if you want to do ad, you know, Amazon advertisement and they don't want to lift a finger to do it, they're not going to, and you can't change that. Um, you're kind of limited in the things that you can do with the book because they own the rights. And oh, by the way, if you didn't hit your quota and they're not responding to you, you're not getting anything done. It's like, it's like you're, 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 uh, I've heard some authors respond to it's like their child is, is lost, you know, like, and they yeah. can't find them. They can't, you know, you can't reach out to them. It's just, it's okay. lost. Start over. Um, so to say, so that's the pros and cons for publishing with self-publishing on the other hand, you do get a much higher, you know, percentage of, of the profit. You know, right now, if you sell a book on Amazon and you're priced between $2.99 and $9.99, you get 70% of all the sale. Uh, that's for ebook, you know, so you're getting a higher percentage. You're also, you have full control. You can do your own ads. You can do your own, you know, whether it's Amazon or Facebook ads, you can post it places. Um, and finally, you also get to collect your own email list, which is big. Uh, if you have, you know, little blurbs inside of your book, those people will be in there. And uh, here's a little warning I'll give too, is if you do sign a publishing deal, I would work in the publishing deal that you get to keep the email list and that you can still put it in there. <laughs> a lot of publishing companies will try to strike that out. I highly recommend to authors that you stick to that. Just put that little blurb in there that allows you to put in a way to collect email and that you get to keep it. Uh, many authors who've given up that rights, ones who were self-published and then went published, lost out on thousands of potential followers because of that one component. So, sorry, I know that was a lot. <laughs> no, no, that's, that's cool. That's, that's yeah. Oh, that was really, that was, that was incredible. Todd, Chloe. I was about to say the same thing. That was perfect. That's exactly what we were hoping like uh, people applause? would get wow. talking with you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and, that was amazing. Yeah. Was, I'm really, I mean, I'm, it's funny because I've learned a lot of those things over the years, but to hear it like that, uh, it's really couldn't put it, uh, it's just lack of words. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I've got to sit on the inside and watch them, you know, uh, argue over which book they're going to put their time and effort towards, you know, or who they're going to put their A team on and things like that. And right. it's just, and I, I can't, I can't stress enough the email part. I think the email to them is like currency. Uh, you know, you have, I, I say the magic number of 10,000, but 10,000 really opens doors. Um, and I, that may feel like a lot, but there are a lot of great tactics that authors can use to really drive up those email um, subscriber rates. I have, a, I have a favorite tactic of mine called the Kobayashi Maru um, that I really think is, is one easy way. But if we, get, if we have time at the end, I'll be more than happy to share it. But otherwise, when it comes to publishing companies, they see your email list as proof. Uh, you know, proof is in the pudding that these That's people liked your story so much that they want your next story. 
which to them means, hey, if we sign this person, we that that author is going to sell a lot of books just from their email list. And so it's a much better indication of success to them. Amazing. Right. It's, it's all about minimizing risk. It's amazing to see how some things have changed over the last 10 years. But I can, I, now looking back, I can see it all going in that direction bit by bit. Yeah, I just, now yep, I'm- Bit that. by bit. And I think it's even oh, more like, so no, in the future. It's one place, you remember, you know? I'm well, like, we, 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 we've done we did okay. a good job. We did, we've done all right. But, you know, it, it's funny. I remember just- even collecting emails 10 years ago and people just didn't really, they didn't, didn't get, really it. get it. Yeah. They didn't, they didn't get, get it. it. It's, it's so, it's so interesting. Cause Britt and I, we were just talking about our first convention just before the panel. And so now it just, we're having a, a twin trip back in time, a, a twin trip of nostalgia. <laughs> well, it's interesting because we, we always, one of our, our main things was to go to conventions and meet our fans, but now it's been essentially going to be gone for another year. So it'll be two years total. So in an interesting way, we're completely restructuring our business completely uh, after almost 15 years. And so, I mean, I think everyone at this period of time in one way or another, except maybe for very few, has to completely change their lives. And yeah, now yeah. it's being a year, we don't know how long this would be going on, on for. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's, even the, I think the online publishing, the independent publishing, even for people that would never have considered that beforehand, I think that gives a lot more control and possibility. Now you, you can't go to conventions, you know, meeting people, everything is now online. So I'm a lot of uh, new authors have or new writers have been talking to me about how they've always wanted to write a book, but they've never had time until the pandemic. So I think we're going to see a surge in a lot of people that have, are going to try to want to learn how to get their books out there because they've had that time to write that 100,000 word book that they've wanted to write for 30 years. Uh, I mean, even our, our 90 year old grandfather is writing and where he's wanted to write for, you know, 90 years, probably 80 years. 80. So... Well, one of the things, I, I'm a hybrid author. I'm, I'm published by Del Rey with the Dragon Riders of Pern series. Uh, I'm published independently. Uh, and I'm also published working together with the twins. And, and one of the things that I found is you move from being an author to being a publisher when you go the self-published route. And you mm -hmm. have to recognize that. Um, that's not a bad thing. You know, you move to a chance of making a lot more money. Uh, you also move to a lot more control or responsibility for what's going on. Uh, if a book doesn't work, um, it's on you. You can't sit there and say, well, the publisher didn't do X, Y, and Z. It's kind of like you did it. You also learn to become um, a lot less involved, engulfed by your books, yeah, um, you begin to recognize that, you know, what you're writing may not be for everybody and you're going to get people who don't like what you wrote. Uh, and as a publisher, you just sort of have to go, okay, and move on. Uh, you, you can, you know, decide that because you've got bad reviews on something, you will write something different. Uh, or you may decide, you know what, I just, this book did not work for that person and I'm sorry. Uh, so that becomes really, really important. Um, the other thing is, once you get those emails, uh, one of the big things, which has become sort of like a huge market in some respects, is how to keep those email, th those those uh, emails working for you. How to keep people interested and engaged in what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And I think Dave has worked on some of that. Uh, and I know he's worked on tools for new writers. Uh, we, if we don't get a plug in for your, your web pages, but before the end of this, uh, oh, oh, I have that. Go. Oh, no, no. So, I, please. Oh, can, I didn't mean to I, interrupt you, Todd. I was, uh, no, I thought you were ready to take over. Oh, I, I was, I was queuing up the ball. It was like, here, now we bring it back to our, whatever. So okay. Dave, I mean, one of the things that I love about what you've got out there is you've got the Amazon bestseller rank, uh, calculator that says, you know, if you're number one, Amazon, the, the absolute top of the list, Amazon, that means you're selling this many books a day yep. uh, yeah. and so on. And, and I find that really interesting. You have put together an amazing set of resources for anybody who wants to become a writer and, and learn how to do it all. Would you talk to that for a second? Yeah, sure. Please, please, please. Well, the latest statistics have that about 70% of book sales are now happening on Amazon. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and so therefore, whether or not you're going through a published company or you're self-publishing, you're still putting it on the same thing that the publishing company is going to put on. That's still going to bring in a large chunk of, of the sales themselves. So one of the things that I love to do is when I try to study the current book market, I really like to look at what's happening on Amazon since it drives the most sales. So one of the things we created was a tool called the Kindle calculator. If you just Google Kindle calculator, it will come up right away. Um, click on that. And what you do is you take the Amazon bestseller rank of any book, you put it in the calculator and it will tell you how many books that day that that book sold. Uh, what's really unique about that, and I think is a really cool idea, especially for authors, is, is that when you're trying to see, when you're trying to research other books or competitors or stories, you can find out how much money those books are making. Uh, and I think that can also kind of give you a bit of an understanding of what's moving in the market. Uh, if there's a book that you really feel is kind of close to the story you're about to you know, write and you test it out and you find out that not one of those books is selling, doesn't mean you can't write the book, but it does mean that there's not a lot of proactive interest in the market. Um, and that can kind of help you to call out some ideas or maybe help you to generate other ideas as well. Uh, to give a bit of information about what that is, the Amazon bestseller rank is a really cool number that Amazon created where it's relative to the number, the total number of sales. So if a book is an ABSR, I'm just gonna call it that from this point on, ABSR of one, then it means it is the number one best-selling book in all of Amazon. And if it's 7.2 million, then it's the worst selling book in all of Amazon. Well, our calculator knows, and we're always updating with publishing companies, but our calculator will say, okay, well, the, it's 95,431. That book is making about this many sales a day. And so you can use that and you can start to figure out what's going on and you can get an understanding of what's moving the market. Thank you. That's, that's, um, I, I, that's been an incredibly helpful tool as Todd said before, and it's been very interesting and very enlightening. It's I would, one of my favorite things about being in the book world right now is I really feel like it's the wild west. Mm. You can do what you, the amount of freedom that an author has, particularly an independent author now, now has the amount of information you're able to get the avenues that you're able to go the, the people you could potentially reach and the power that's been placed into our individual hands is startling and empowering and fantastic compared to what you could do 10 years ago yeah to, to add on something we talked about a little bit earlier um todd touched upon is how you know, a lot of us authors are very sensitive artistic types and to self-publish or be independent published even to work with publishing companies you know that book is your heart and soul and it's your your baby and you love it uh and to disassociate and go okay it's a product now that's a difficult thing it's difficult and also when you're dealing with the internet you have no idea what people are going to write and nor it doesn't even matter because uh, people all around the world someone can be jealous someone can be, it really does not they could be drunk they could be drunk. this could be a random drunk person in the middle of who knows where just commenting randomly you don't know who it's who's commenting. you know and, and if someone doesn't like uh your 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 book for whatever reason because they don't understand it or they're not the right audience and they may give you a bad review it's about overcoming that and persevering because it really doesn't matter and filtering out and go you just can't focus on it uh, i mean or there's always i've seen these before um very critical fans that will give you bad like not great reviews but just okay reviews but then buy everything you ever so, sometimes mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and i'm like wait what are you are you my super fan like they comment on everything you ever do but they'll give you like a three star. Sometimes the best fan you'll ever have that will promote you more than anyone will also be the most critical fan that you have. It's like, wait, what? Uh, and, or then, and then you'll have ones that want you to write in something else, but really you gotta step away and say, okay, I'm not just that sensitive author. I'm more than that now. Because if you wanna make a living at it, you can't just be that sensitive artist anymore. I think there's only one cure to that that I've found, which is write more. Yep that it, 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 it's something if you have a lot of work and one person doesn't like one book is different than somebody not liking your only book because your your entire artistic identity is tied in with only one book exactly but if you have several stories you could look at it even more objectively and think oh that's clearly a romance fan and this is hard military sci-fi that's not going to work 
So that's what I found over the years, that and just um, taking everything with a grain of salt. And, and I think we have to do that now with everything because everything is online. Especially when promoting yourself and, you know, we're identical twins. Oh, what we so have gotten, we get, we get some interesting Interesting. Interesting, <laughs> interesting yes. And, you know, people have made pro profiles about us on websites that have absolutely nothing to do with uh, writing and strictly to do with our, our looks and other interesting things. So, nope, 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 nope. And nope, we nope, just nope, go, nope. okay, we have no control, you know, move forward past it. And for some people, the, the other thing that I, I would tell myself when dealing with that, besides writing more, is do not engage. Yeah. Do not. So a lot of people think, okay, I'm going to tell this person that said something bad. I'm going to give them a comeback that's so fiery that they are not going to know what to say. And I'm going to sit here all night and I'm going to write it. And then I'm going to post it to my Facebook friends and I'm going to post it to my Instagram friends. and be like, look what I did. But it's really all about attention. Don't feed the trolls. You don't feed the trolls. And if someone says it to me, it's if someone says one bad thing, I go, Okay, maybe I'll leave it up there. Two bad things, I'll delete it. Three bad things, I block them. Don't ever feed the trolls. And then it depending, there's certain people you realize are just not maybe socially aware or they don't have any bad intentions. And then I'll just re re reply very respectfully and be like, I'm not sure this is what you mean. And I'm sure this happens to male authors as well, but as female, female authors, like, yeah, we yeah. get a different type of fan that isn't interested in what we write. Uh, and so... That has to be handled very delicately because if you anger someone, they could possibly go off and write reviews of books that they didn't even read. At a certain point, you have to realize, you know, never be afraid to block somebody. Yeah. Never be afraid to block somebody because it's, you know, you're on there every single day and that's your little world, right? You're, you, you always spend more time on Facebook and all these applications than we do with our actual friends, I think. Nowadays. Yeah. So if someone, so which means that person becomes part of your daily life sometimes more than the people that you love. So never be afraid to hit the block button or, you know, unfollow. So I think we're going to have to wrap things up because we hit the hour mark. So what I well, want... I, before we do, okay. I, think, okay. Before we I do. think we should give Dave a chance to tell us about some of the cool things he's doing and where people can go to find all of these great resources he's got online. So we were, just about, we were just about to say that, and then I was going to ask you the same question. So, yes, Dave. Dave. How can we find more about your work and on... learn what you have to teach us? Oh, sure. Uh, well, uh, you can go to kindlepreneur.com, Kindle Entrepreneur, kindlepreneur.com. Um, that's where I'm constantly coming out with new articles about the latest in the online uh, book industry as well as print industry. Um, if you're not really sure where to start, say this just sounds like a lot of stuff, um, just type into Google Kindlepreneur and start here or book marketing 101, uh, and it should show up number one. And that's how I break down the entire process all the way from coming up with your idea straight down to, uh, ending your long-term marketing plan. And think of that article as kind of like the table of content to, if I ever wrote my master book on how to write self-publish and market a book, that's the table of content right there. And it will link to every article or video that will help you along the way. Uh, I think when, that's probably the best place for people to start. And when are you going to write this book? Well, in truth is that that actual, that, that's honestly the book right there. People don't have to pay for it. You can click on the link. It takes you right to it. And some of the articles I actually send in there aren't mine because somebody wrote it better than me. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not just a collection of my work. It's what I think is the best lessons across the board from idea to finish. And so um, you can get that for free. Also, you've just started a whole, and, and explain it, because I'm not going to explain it well, but you've started a whole bunch of online courses that are connected, yours and, and other great people that are, that are dealing with this. Would you talk to that real quick? Sure. Well, you know, I've found that when people are trying to learn how to write, publish, and market a book, uh, two things end up happening. Either A, they follow one particular person and they only buy the course of that one person because that's the only person they know. Or B, they go to something like Udemy and they buy a whole bunch of courses and a lot of them are really bad. Um, mm -hmm. And so there's just this major hang up. So what we started doing was because Kindlepreneur gets about 250,000 visitors per month to it, 
Um, I had my team work to go find all these courses from all these authors from different genres to uh, different areas. Um, you know, some courses focus on how to you know, format beautiful books to others are how to set up your email. And so we created this, what's called a course marketplace, really. Um, and there you can find a list of all of these different courses from, from trusted creators. And then what's even cooler is that when you click on the course, you can look to see, um, it's kind of like a cookie cutter of every course that we created. So you can see who it's for, what you'll learn, the actual curriculum, the price, uh, who the instructor is, and then you can compare a course side by side to actually see which one's best. Back in the day, you would go to somebody's landing page and maybe they would tell you what the price is, or maybe they would tell you what the lessons actually are. But in this case, we've done it for you and it's all listed there. So we believe that through this, uh, authors will not only be able to see what else is out there, but really find courses that fit their particular need. Um, and finally, my favorite part is they can leave reviews. So back in the day, if you bought so-and-so's course, the only reviews you would see is whichever they choose to show. Uh, right. In this case, this is untouched. We do have three rules on leaving rules, uh, uh, leaving reviews. The first is no profanity. I'm not down for that uh, because I don't know the ages of everybody reading this, but that keep it clean. Um, the second thing is do not attack the creator. Be, and the third is be constructive about the course. Uh, we're not here to create hate or anything, but just tell, I didn't find this useful. This did not help me. Um, other than that though, any review, no matter what, whether it's on my course, even if it's a one star, it gets posted. So you can see how authors have really benefited or not from a course. So it's just another way to kind of open it up and help potential writers find the right thing for them. Awesome. And, and the reason I'm all behind this is because, as I think I've said before, uh, writers start out as readers and we're always looking for more good stuff to read. So I want more writers out there. They may not be writing the stuff that I want, but the more writers, the more chance there is that I'll find the next great book that I, I'm just going to fall in love with. That's great. And you know what? I, I write so much fiction. I actually prefer to read nonfiction. So uh, that's one of the reasons why I've been and reading what uh, Dave has been writing and, and working on it. Just, it I find it so interesting. And also that's the reason why Todd has been giving you an exceedingly hard time about not reading enough. Fiction. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you know, you, most people, I guess, don't know Todd well enough. I mean, all people, except for us, know that that's the Todd disapproving face was like, you need to read more fiction. But, you always uh, need to read more fiction. If you're going to write fiction, you should be reading until your eyeballs fall out. So yeah, it's it, it or, or your ears fall off if you're if you're doing audio. Oh, uh, this has been just a, such a great panel. Uh, Todd, we want to know where to get your work and where to find you on the internets and webs. Oh my God! Uh, actually, probably the easiest thing nowadays, be given the way the market's working, go to Amazon.com and search for Todd McCaffrey. Uh, T o d d m c c a f f r e y. Yay. Awesome. And then for Britt and I, we are winner twins. So like winning, but winner and then twins. And we're on Instagram. Primarily, I'd, I'd say Instagram and Facebook. We're also somewhat on Twitter. I find that Instagram is really where everyone is. That's right now. where I think for our, just because we're, we're, our demographic seems to be on, on Instagram, but we're still learning. So Amazon, Instagram, Facebook. So we're under, um, Winner twins, and then I'm under Brianna Winner, and then she's under Brittany Winner, or Brittany Brit Winner, Winner, or Brit Winner, and also we have um, also looking on Amazon, looking at our uh, our works. You know, we have books on writing, we have books with Todd that are fantasy that are a lot of fun, science fiction for what we're known for, and some poetry just to keep things interesting. Uh, and then hopefully in the next uh, year, I'll be able to write about what it's like to be a creator with chronic illness and blindness. And hopefully, because I, especially at these conventions, I meet so many people like myself that want to get into writing and creating, but deal with something as tremendous as uh, a medical issue, which is really a full-time job. So that's my, my next goal. And I also think being disabled um, and being a writer are great. It's just a great way to make a living. And that's why another reason why I think what, what Dave is doing is so incredible and helping so many people. It's a, it's a really good quality of life. It's a great quality being of life. A, being a writer full-time when you go to panels, I think the way to end it is, is this, that being a, a writer full-time, it's not an easy path, but the fact is, is there's no such thing as an easy path. But if it's your passion, then it's a fulfilling one, and it's a life that's filled with love. And I'd say, 
go for it. And if there's any way we could help, please let any of us know. Thank all you so much right. for Thank joining so much. us. And big internet hugs from all of us. Internet hugs. Mm -hmm. We expect all of you to do that. Oh, oh yeah. Perfect. All right. All right. <laughs> okay. All right. Bye, everybody.